We think that we read the Bible. Truthfully, we don't. The Bible reads us. And there are moments as we are reading the Bible when God reaches out and speaks to exactly who we are, where we are, what his will and purposes are in very clear, powerful, unmistakable ways. Sometimes a word from God's word leaps off the page and grabs you and becomes your life verse for the rest of your days. God did that to me. And today, I'm going to share with you the story of my life verse. It was just another night at college. And I was on the third floor of Moody Library on the campus of Baylor University studying with my wife, Rhonda. I actually, she wasn't my wife then, but I was working on her. And I got tired of doing my philosophy homework, and I pulled out my Bible and opened it up and started picking up again. We're now at where I, the point I was in reading through the Bible that year. I was in the book of Jonah. I began reading through the book of Jonah, and suddenly, bam, there it was. A verse I had never noticed before in all my reading of Scripture. This amazing, incredible, awesome verse right there in front of me. The more I read it, the more excited I got. This was the verse that I read in this Bible and noticed for the first time. Jonah chapter 4, verse 7. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the gore tree plant and it withered. I mean, is that not the most amazing thing that you have ever read? I just couldn't stand it. I punched my wife, Rhonda, my girlfriend, Rhonda, and I said to her, darling, I just found the verse that's going to change your life. She said, what is it? I told her, and she said, you're strange. You are really strange. What is so interesting to you about that verse? I said, it's absolutely incredible. It's absolutely unbelievable. I want you to think about the scene. What is God up to? God is trying to teach the prophet Jonah a lesson. You know his story. Rebelled against the mission assignment God gave him. God had to send a great fish to keep him in his belly. And after three days of free seafood, Jonah finally agreed he would pick up that assignment. He went to Nineveh to preach. He wanted God to destroy the people of Nineveh. He wanted God to do away with these people who were attacking all the kingdoms of the earth. Very cruel, very barbaric. He wanted God to get rid of them. He finally consented to go. He got to Nineveh. He preached 40 days and 40 nights. Yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Yet 40 days and God's going to burn you right up. I mean, he was a warm, loving pastoral preacher. And after 40 days of preaching like that, something amazing happened. Everybody in Nineveh, from the king on his throne to the drunk in the gutter, everybody in Nineveh began to cry out to God, began to repent. Not only did the king put on sackcloth and ashes, he wanted the animals to have sackcloth on them and ashes. They cried out to God for forgiveness. God forgave Nineveh and spared Nineveh. More than 120,000 people and Jonah is ticked off that God saved and spared Nineveh. God had to teach him a lesson about why all people matter to God, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. So here's this great, mighty prophet. God has to teach this great man of God a very important spiritual lesson. So out of all the angels in heaven that God could have used, and he used angels to intervene and give his word to people from time to time. Out of everything in all of God's creation that God could have used. Out of all the men and women on the face of the earth that God could have used. Out of every tool at God's disposal that God could use to teach this great man of God a very important spiritual lesson. What did God choose? A little worm. God appointed a worm. Can you imagine what it must have been like for that worm when God came and knocked on his little worm door one day and he opened it up and there was God saying, hello worm, I've come to appoint you. Probably dropped his worm teeth. I mean, we just don't expect 
God to do something great in our lives. We expect God to do something great in the lives of other people. Other people have more talent and ability. Other people have more skills. We don't expect something profound to happen in our souls, in our lives. But God has such an intimate knowledge of you. For God to use that worm, God had to know and find that one particular worm at that one particular time. And if God knew every aspect of creation in such intimate detail that he could find and use that one little worm, what do you think is God's knowledge of you? How well do you think God knows you? Psalm 139 says it so beautifully. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I stand up. You know when I sit down. You know every word I'm going to say before it leaves my mouth. You have gone ahead of me. You are behind me. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot even comprehend this. Where could I go to get away from your presence? Where could I go to hide from you? If I said darkness will cover me and night will hide me, even the night shines as bright as the day to you. If I threw a rope around the sun and rode its rays to the end of the earth, even there you would be waiting for me to lead me and to guide me. Where could I go that you couldn't find me? You came to me while I was still in the womb of my mother unshaped, unformed, and you saw all of my days before I lived one of them. Hebrew word for that. Wow! God knows your name. God knows the color of your hair, ladies, the real color of your hair. Guys, God knows every hair you used to have on that head. Everything there is to know about us, God knows. God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, is intimately, thoroughly acquainted with you. If God could find and appoint a worm, what kind of plans do you think God has? But I want you to notice that was not just a God-appointed worm. God didn't just come to that worm and said, this is God, I've come to appoint you and leave. That was a God-appointed worm with a God-appointed task. God had something specific that he wanted him to do. Every good Baptist ought to know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But don't stop in the middle of the sentence. Go ahead, finish the sentence. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to, go, to do good works, which God has already prepared for those who love him. God has more in mind than the salvation of our souls. God has in mind the usefulness of our lives. And God has plans for every one of us, ways that he intends every one of us to serve him and fulfill his purposes. For that little worm, he said, I want you to go to that gore tree plant on top of that hill where Jonah is sitting there pouting, and I want you to attack and chew on that gore tree plant until it withers so I can teach Jonah a lesson. Can you imagine being a little infinitesimal part of God's creation and knowing the Creator, the Lord, has a specific role and purpose for me. Husband or wife, single, married, child, adult, highly intelligent, or simple-minded evangelist like me. Talented, skilled, can't do anything that anybody would want you to do. Nobody ever asked you to lead in silent prayer. Whatever you are, whoever you are, God has a purpose 
for you and a way to incorporate your life into the work of his kingdom. That was a God-appointed worm with a God-appointed task. Can you imagine that little worm when he showed up to do his job? The Bible says he started early at dawn the next day. He went out and he attacked that gore tree plant. Now, can you imagine when that little worm saw that gore tree plant for the first time? Little worm, big gore tree plant, big enough to keep a shadow over Jonah all day long under that hot Mideastern sun. I can just see it now as the worm topped that hill and looked at that gore tree plant that God wanted him to get. I can't believe he wants me to eat the whole thing. This must be the wrong gore tree plant. God believes in you more than you believe in yourself. I have never found God calling me to do things I thought I could do. I have always found God calling me to assignments that are beyond what I see in the mirror when I look at me. Do you think when I was a student at the seminary I ever had any imagination that I would one day be president of the seminary? Not hardly. Do you think it was a really exciting, wonderful, uh, enjoyable, delightful, uh, affirming, terrific moment? When I was the president of the seminary and Hurricane Katrina came through New Orleans, nearly destroying the city and the seminary, do you understand that what you do is not based upon your ability and your potential? What God calls you to do is based upon His plans and His purposes. And no matter what you think about yourself, no matter how you see yourself, God sees you as His servant. And God calls you to His work his task, his service that he wants to do through you, not that looks right, feels right, feels comfortable inside you. Bless that little worm's heart. That was an awfully big gore tree plant, and he was just a little worm. But he was a God-appointed worm, and he had his God-appointed task, and he dove in, and he just started chewing on that gore tree plant. Well, I was doing some study on this passage after I really got excited about it. I discovered that biblical scholars are pretty certain what that plant was, that it was a gourd tree plant. It was a castor oil gourd tree plant. I, I don't know what some of you students know about castor oil. Uh, does the term x lax mean anything to you? I mean, it, it is not pleasant. It was a classic American home medicine for a long time, and there's nobody on the earth who likes to, it, it tastes horrible, and it doesn't have a pleasant effect. And can you imagine the first bite of that worm? Huge gore tree plant, little worm, and every inch of that plant, castor oil. I mean, I could just imagine. <laughs> this must be the wrong gore tree plant. God, I, I asked for root beer. You know, I, I, I prefer Dr. Pepper. God couldn't possibly want me here. It's always a shock. It is always a shock. When we are so filled with knowledge and confidence in the love of God for us and the power and grace of God that sustain us, it is always a shock when we are so full of a sense of the grip of God on our life and suddenly life thrusts us into a dark place or a hard road. It is always a shock. I know. Because I've had to cast oil on this campus. My whole world, everything I knew about me and my life and my ministry collapsed. Here. I know. Because I was sitting next to my wife when we heard the doctor pronounce that word, cancer. 
your teacher. I know, because I was sitting on the end of a bed in a hotel in Birmingham, Alabama, watching the city of New Orleans go underwater when the levees broke and watching as a helicopter from a news channel flew again and again over our campus and I could see the cars floating and the trees down and the flooded and knew that everybody in the NOBTS family had just one question. What is Dr. Kelly going to do now? Cast your vote. If you haven't tasted it yet, you will. I started reading the biographies of great Christians when I was a student in college. And it was very interesting to me as I began reading the biographies of great Christians, this pattern began to emerge. Every biography of a great Christian leader that I ever read, what I found was that over the story of their life, there was at least one or more very dark and difficult experiences. George Truitt, pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, he was a legend before Dr. Criswell got there and became another legend. George Truitt, who preached an incredible sermon from the steps of a Washington monument uh, that was probably the most famous message ever preached from the steps of a Washington monument until Martin Luther King was on the mall and did I have a dream. George Truitt, best known pastor of the day, went hunting with some friends, climbing over a fence. His gun slipped out of his hand, hit the ground, went off accidentally, shot his best friend, the sheriff of Dallas, in the leg. They took him to the hospital, and unfortunately, he died of complications from that wound. And every Sunday for the rest of George Truitt's life, a pastor in the area would call him every Sunday morning and say, how can a murderer like you stand up and preach the gospel at First Baptist Dallas? Would, would you like to be that person? Charles Spurgeon, you ever heard of him? Preaching to 5,000 people a week by the time he was 20, 21 years old. Stenographer in the congregation take down his sermons as he preached them, draw up a galley print. He'd edit the galley print, and then they would be printed in the major newspapers of the world by the next week all over the world. Would you love to be Charles Spurgeon? Did you know that soon after he got married, his wife became almost a total invalid, and from that point forward, she rarely got to go and hear her husband preach. Did you know when they were having to expand the church, build a new church, because so many people came, they were using a rented hall, the largest meeting hall in all of London, and one of the first Sundays they were in that hall, some kids got into baggers, packed out, and they began crying out, fire, 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 just to create some chaos. People began to stampede, the floor collapsed, people were hurt, people were killed. And Spurgeon blamed himself that people died because they came to hear him preach that day. And he wrestled with depression the rest of his days. Would you like to be him on that Sunday? Can you imagine when that shock of the dark road comes to you? And your heart does what our hearts instinctively do and cry out to God, why me, God, why me? Can you hear Job snickering in the background? Can you hear Paul the Apostle laugh when you think being in the middle of some tough times is a sign that God doesn't love you? As he hears the executioner coming down the step to cut off his head? Every story of every believer includes castor oil along the way. It doesn't mean you've been disobedient. It doesn't mean you're on the wrong road. It means that all of us, every one of us, in being faithful to do the work that God has prepared us and called us to do, will discover that work includes castor oil. Driving down I-65, somewhere in Alabama, pulled off to stop for the night, saying Hampton Inn somewhere just off I-65 in North Alabama. 
checking in the hotel. Two ladies behind the desk, one who worked there obviously was a manager type, trainee, the other person who was obviously new. As they're going through the process of checking me in, my cell phone rings and it's my wife Rhonda. I always take those calls. I pulled out my phone, I said, hello gorgeous. That's how I always answer calls from her. I said, hello gorgeous. I'm in the middle of checking in. Would it be okay if I called you back in about five minutes or so when I get up to my room? She said, sure, that'll be great. Hung up the phone and I looked up and the two ladies were laughing at me. And they said, well, that was cute. I said, oh, it's more than cute. If you knew my wife, you would say it was beautiful. And you would wonder how in the world would she marry somebody like me? Well, they laughed and they said, well, that's cute too. And one of them said, you know, my husband used to say things like that before he died. She was not an old lady. And I said, ma'am, I'm very sorry. Has your husband died recently? Is that why you're here? She said, yeah, we were up in the oil fields in the Dakotas working and he got sick and he died up there and we didn't have any connection up there except the work, so I came home. I just moved back a few weeks ago. They said, well, ma'am, I'm so sorry for your loss and I wanna pray for you. But I wanna tell you one thing before I pray for you. It's very counterintuitive. People don't expect it. But you know something? Several years ago, Jesus Christ completely changed my life. Just completely changed my life. He brought into my life such a joy and peace as I really can't describe. And people think when that happens to somebody, it means they have a blessed life and nothing bad ever happens. I said, but let me tell you an inside secret. When I look back on the Hall of Fame moments of my life, the most incredible experiences I've ever had with God. Always, in every case, those Hall of Fame moments with God have come at the points of my deepest hurts and deepest disappointments. One of the really great things about Jesus is what he's able to do when life brings That's the truth. Most profound experience of the love of God I've ever had in all of my life happened here when I was a student. When our life blew up. Details aren't important. You can plug in your own story. The bookstore used to be in the building that's now the level center for church growth. And I would go over there all the time, just look at books. I was in there one day after everything happened. I was just numb. I, I didn't know what in the world I was going to do with my life. And I'm just walking around looking at books out of habit. I guess I just get high smelling ink and paper. And I'm just walking around looking at, at books. It was near Christmas time. The audio music for the bookstore was playing this album I never heard before. And it was on an old A-track tape player, and that's a... That, would have songs, four songs on a set, and then it would change and play continually. But it was broken, and it would only play the same four songs over and over. It was very busy, so no one had time to fix it. And I'm there, and this little chorus, unbelievably simple little chorus that I had never heard before in 1976, began to play. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. The chaos that was unfolding created a financial crisis as well. well I, I had no money. I couldn't buy that and take it home. And so, for more than three hours, I leaned against the end of a bookcase, nobody having any idea what was going on with me. Every fourth song, oh, how he loves you, oh, how he loves me. If you go in the level center in one of their conference rooms, you'll see a plaque dedicated to the people who furnished that conference room. And right where that plaque is, the gully room, right where that plaque is, that's where I stood. And God put my life back together. And the rest of my life began from that moment. Make no doubt about it. 
You are here because God has called you to his kingdom service, and I hope you are pumped, excited, and thrilled about that. And God is going to do things in your life that will surprise you. And God's going to call you to do things that seem beyond you, beyond your abilities, beyond your personality. And don't ever be intimidated or afraid by that. Just know that what God calls you to do, God is going to do. And along the way, you're going to have, maybe while you're here in seminary, maybe down the road, but you're going to get to the castor oil of that gore tree plant eventually, maybe more than once. It's been more than once for me. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of the worst the world can do because God's grace is sufficient to see you through. I didn't read that in a book. I lived that in a life. Do not be afraid. Bless that little worm's heart. He dove into that gourd tree plant, took one bite, and it was cast away, every inch of it cast away. Little worm, big gourd tree plant. Every inch of it cast away. And bless his little worm's heart. He just kept chewing. My favorite part of Jonah 4-7. Last two words. God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day. It attacked the gourd tree plant, and it withered. It withered. At the end of the day, that was one sick little worm. But guess who won? Guess what happened? The gourd tree plant withered. Jonah cried out in dismay to God. He missed the shade of a plant. God was able to say to him, if you miss the shade of a plant, don't you think I would miss the lives of 120,000 people? God taught his lesson. The worm accomplished his mission. It withered. And this is the thing that we learn. It doesn't matter how big the challenge is in front of you. When it is something that God has given you, God will make a way. God will make a way. And if you ever doubt that you remember that you came to a chapel service and you sat in this chapel in a chapel service in 2019 because in 2005 this was the biggest doghouse in New Orleans Katrina King flooded our campus from that street all the way back everything was flooded Nearly all of us became homeless like that. Trees down everywhere, limbs down everywhere, and there was a hole in that door, that side door right back there. There was a hole, and some stray dog found that hole, and that dog moved in to the nicest doghouse in the whole city of New Orleans. And he had a wonderful time until the National Guard came to our campus and found him and got him out and fixed the door. I cannot tell you what it was like to be the guy everybody expected to solve the problems created by Katrina. But I can tell you one thing. In spite of it being me, with all my limitations, all my weak points, and the situation being completely overwhelming, God overcame all the difficulties created by Katrina. 
Nina, and you are here today because of it. Don't ever be afraid. God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day. It attacked the gourd tree plant, and it withered. Well, that's wonderful, but what in the world does a worm have to do with people? thought you'd never ask. John chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus said, you have not chosen me. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bring forth fruit so that your fruit would remain forever. God has chosen you. The little worm is but an example of what God does with those he chooses. So my question is this. What have you done with God's choice of you? What have you done? Are you being faithful and obedient? Are you giving God's assigned task the very best that you have? Are you on the bad road and getting discouraged? What have you done with this incredible truth? For I want to challenge you to understand and accept God's divine appointment as the driving, consuming force of your life. And I want you to join the fellowship of the worms. Embrace what God's up to in your life. Be faithful. When the shock of the castor oil comes, keep chewing. Keep going and know at the end of the day, guess who wins? Jesus. Always, in every case, Jesus will accomplish what he sets out to do and glory in the fact that of all the people on the earth he could have chosen, he chose you. So if you go in my office and you see a rock on my desk that has painted on the top of it, God appointed a worm. And now you'll know why. That's my life verse. Father, thank you for having a Bible that reads me, that reads us. A Bible, Father, that I do not have to search because it searches me. A Bible that is constantly seeking to speak into my heart and in my life where I am with what you want me to hear, what you want me to know. I pray, Father, for me and for all of us that you would keep us in your word. Had I not opened your word that night, I would not have found that verse that has become so instrumental in my mission in my life. Keep us in the Word. And I pray that you would ever keep us focused on one simple truth. You chose us. The work you assign is by your choice, not by our merits or our talents. And that you would help us, Father, when that castor oil comes to ever be faithful, to ever stay focused, and know, at the end of the day, Jesus is going to win. It's in his name that we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.